After doing my second episode of Ben 10 Aliens as Dragons, I was reminded how much I love working with Ben 10 designs, so I started thinking of some new concepts and pretty quickly came up with some interesting ideas for how to fit Ben 10 lore into the universe of my demon episodes. As I often do with demon episodes, taking a bit more creative liberties with transferring over the stories, but I think in this case, just makes for that much more interesting of an alternate version of Ben 10 characters. Slightly different format story from my usual demon episodes, but I think you're all gonna enjoy it. So let's get into it, shall we? Let's go. Hit like if you want. Subscribe if you feel like. But either way, enjoy the show. In early August of 1962, Ben Tennyson was growing suspicious about his grandpa Max and cousin Gwen. He didn't know what, but he was pretty sure they were hiding something from him. Anytime he asked, though, they just dismissed him as paranoid. Ben's parents had sent him with his grandpa to spend the summer in his RV traveling the country, but now Ben was even confused by the circumstances of the trip. His parents had pulled him out of school a week early, and now, instead of hitting the biggest sites they could, the trio were just spending time in forests and old campsites. They were even traveling weird side roads instead of taking the fastest paths. Grandpa Max said it was to see the scenic routes, but Ben wasn't really buying it. It was like they were doing all they could to avoid seeing other people. Weirder still, Ben was noticing that regularly Max and Gwen had new cuts and bruises across their skin that they tried to hide from him. He was thinking about all the evidence of something weird going on while they rumbled along a gravel road in the middle of nowhere, and the combination of the mounting suspicious activity with the quaking of the vehicle was pushing Ben to a boiling point. He finally stood up and marched to the front of the RV and demanded that Max tell him what was going on. Max gave a forced laugh and once more tried to dismiss Ben's questioning, but Ben wasn't having it this time. He yelled out that he wasn't going to take their lying anymore. The second Ben riled up like that, Max's face went white. He tried to calm Ben down and Gwen came up and spoke weirdly calmly and nicely to him. That just made him even more angry. But soon, Ben noticed that the angrier he got, the more his eyes were glazing over. He suddenly noticed how faint he was and that his body was shaking, but not simply from rage. A sudden sense of deja vu came over him as his eyes coated over black. He didn't understand what was happening, but somehow he knew that it had happened before. He almost fell over as Max slammed on the RV brakes, then grabbed Ben and ran him out of the vehicle, but Ben was fading in and out at that point. He focused as best he could on everything he was feeling, but that turned out to be an incredibly painful thing to do. His bones felt like they were shifting under his skin. His ribs felt like something was trying to burst its way out of them. Focusing on the pain was near unbearable, but it was all he could do to stay conscious. And it was working. His vision very slowly started to come back as the pain began to fade, but it was like he was looking through someone else's eyes. He couldn't control his body, and he was now towering over Grandpa, who ran to the side of the RV and was opening up a panel that Ben didn't even know existed. Grandpa pulled out a sledgehammer that he was coating the end over in some kind of silver dust. Ben tried to move or talk, but nothing he attempted worked. Instead, his body stomped forward against his will and reached four spiked red and black arms towards his grandpa. Max swung a hammer right up towards Ben's head. Whoever was controlling Ben didn't even try to dodge it. He let the strike hit, and it barely felt like a nudge. Ben felt his vocal cords rumble as his body laughed. He grabbed the hammer, but Grandpa, with surprisingly nimble movements for his age, dove under Ben's legs. But he couldn't avoid all four arms for long. Ben's body managed to snatch the hammer away and snapped it like a twig, before tossing the pieces aside and grabbing his grandpa by the neck and the legs. Ben could feel that his body was about to start pulling in opposite directions. He was going to rip his grandpa in half. He tried screaming and writhing anything to stop what was happening. Still, the arms started to pull and Grandpa cried out in pain. Ben was terrified that he was about to watch helplessly as he killed his own Grandpa, but in the horror, finally, with an altered, thundering voice, Ben yelled out, STOP! His body, indeed, stopped pulling, and just stayed frozen in place. Grandpa looked astounded. Before Ben could attempt anything else, he heard Gwen yelling for Grandpa Max to close his eyes and shut his mouth. She skidded in front of Ben holding a shotgun with a wide-ended barrel. She pulled the trigger and a cloud of silver dust exploded into Ben's face. He dropped Max and stumbled backwards. That 
was the last thing he remembered before his consciousness finally slipped away. Ben awoke on a cot in the RV, but knew for certain what he'd experienced was not just a dream. He jumped out of bed and marched out of the parked vehicle to see Grandpa and Gwen preparing a meal. Grandpa started to say, good morning, as if nothing had happened, but Ben quickly demanded to know what had gone on last night. Grandpa asked if Ben really did remember what had happened this time. Of course, with the words, this time, sticking out as one of Ben's main concerns. Grandpa finally started to explain and didn't pull his punches. Ben had been cursed by a powerful demon. Ben would have protested that demons weren't real if he hadn't seen what he'd seen the previous night. Grandpa went on to say that a cursed crystal called the Demonatrix had been placed in Ben's body that made him a conduit for ten different demons that could take over Ben's body when he became significantly scared, angry, ashamed, or grief-stricken. The first night they discovered this was when Ben had turned into a demon that could possess and warp technology. Without Ben knowing a demon called Upreglatos, that had been hard to track previously as it normally only targeted Amish people, had overtaken Ben's body and spent a night tormenting his own parents with haunted versions of their radio, vacuum, car, and even toaster. When he'd awoken, Ben acted like nothing had happened, apparently having no memory of his possession. So his parents called Max to take Ben away for the summer, keeping him away from other people and trying to fix him. But Ben still didn't understand why Max, or what Gwen was doing there. It turned out Gwen had learned a little secret of Max's a year prior, and was now in training with him to work for an organization he'd helped start back during the Great Depression. After the First World War, the world itself was obviously already in great distress, and the stock market crash of 1929 had just caused another great uptick in fear and unease. It seemed that that also correlated in a massive rise in strange disappearances and deaths that Max and some of his friends soon realized were being caused by supernatural entities, monsters that seemed to seek out those who were the most fearful. Most people they told didn't believe them that these creatures were out there, but some had seen these demons, or even been hunted by them and lived, having overcome their fears enough to fight back and escape. A small group formed that eventually grew into what they now called the Predator Coalition of Demon Hunters. Though publicly they'd often pretend they were plumbers or some other profession that could gain them access to people's homes that they believed may be the target of demon attacks. Max believed that was why Ben had been targeted. Some powerful, vengeful demon had likely wanted to get back at Max for helping found the ever-growing group that was fairly successfully hunting down and killing demons, or at least warding them off. Ben could feel himself growing angry, then scared about the fact that he was angry. How far did he have to go into an emotion for a demon to take him over? And were the transformations always that painful? He was suddenly glad he didn't remember the other ones, but he also knew that he had to find some way to control it, as he'd almost seemed to that previous night. Ben looked around his body and didn't see this apparent demonatrix crystal on him. Max said that last they'd seen it, it had sunk into Ben's body so that it was no longer visible, and presumably to keep the hunters from trying to remove it. Their conversation was far from over, but suddenly a call came in on the RV's radio. Max bolted inside to answer and was very eager to hear the news. He quickly told Gwen and Ben to pack everything up. As risky as it was, they finally had to go into a big city. Quick interruption to say that I have a brand new ink bundle available on the Popcraft Studios Teespring store. It's got over 90 inks in it for $9 American from the last couple of months Popcraft Studios videos, meaning there's dragons, superheroes, SCPs, all kinds of different stuff in there. But if you're on the Popcraft Studios Patreon, you already have access to all of these inks because high resolution art and inks go up on Patreon a day before a video releases. Plus you get access to all of my past ink bundles as well. So the new ink bundle or the Patreon are both great options if you want to color some Popcraft Studio stuff. I'll put links to both in the description, but for now, back into more demons. Let's go. When they were on the road again, Max told Ben that they'd been staying away from civilization to keep people safe from Ben's demons, but that they'd also been following close on the trail of a kid that the Coalition was trying to track down. 
See, they believe the Demonatrix was created by a demon in response to something called the Gems of the Angelic. They were a set of powerful crystals created by angels to try and grant select humans with different abilities with which to fight back against demons. One had been granted to a young man of 15 years old who eventually joined the Coalition for some time, before his unfortunate demise. All they knew about his death was that he'd been hunting down a demon by the name of Soriaclis, and his body had been found days later, torn to shreds and the crystal gone. They'd assumed that the demon had taken it, but they got word weeks later that a young drifter pickpocket of roughly 11 years old had been spotted with it. But any time someone from the Coalition had tried to approach him, he'd fled. They desperately needed to find him, because if they could get him to work with the Coalition, they could keep him near Ben to weaken the demons Ben turned into any time he transformed, making him far less of a threat until they could figure out how to remove the Demonatrix. You see, this specific angelic gem allowed the user to steal the abilities from any demon they touched, rendering the demon powerless until they released the abilities. The wielder of the gem could hold the powers of a demon for as long as they wanted, but they could only use the power of one demon at a time. Or so the Coalition thought. Regardless, they either needed the boy's help, or to convince him to give up the gem by tapping it three times and saying the phrase, Gem of the Angelic, I relinquish your might. Ben tried to stay as calm as possible as they all drove to New York City, where the boy with the gem had last been spotted lurking around the alleys outside a bar that had many drunk patrons he could pick money from. When the RV was approaching the location, Ben's stomach started to dramatically churn. He started to panic, thinking he was transforming again. Max and Gwen told him to breathe as slowly as possible and focus on a recent positive memory. Luckily, it wasn't necessary in this case, as Ben hadn't been transforming at all. The Demonatrix had simply been moving through Ben's body and suddenly emerged, partially protruding from his forearm. It seemed to be pulling Ben's hand as if trying to guide him, but they weren't sure if they should follow it. This cursed crystal couldn't be leading them to anything positive, could it? Max and Gwen both concealed weapons and cautiously they all decided to follow, heading out into an alley, down some side streets, and soon enough, spotted a kid in a sleeveless black shirt, counting bills that he'd snagged, with a purple crystal sticking out of his own arm and pulsing with light. Frustrated, he shook his arm and banged the crystal against the wall behind him, telling it to shut up, but then noticed Ben, Max, and Gwen approaching down the alley. He backed up a step and thrust out an arm that suddenly transformed into an alligator-like claw, power he'd taken from the last demon to try hunting him down. But as soon as he noticed the gem sticking out of Ben's arm, his defensiveness turned to curiosity. They explained the situation to him, that they could give him work with the Coalition and even a home if he was willing to help them keep Ben's demons under control. But the boy, who said his name was Kevin, didn't seem interested in a job. As they finished their pitch, he said he had a counter-offer. He could just take all the demon powers off Ben's hands. He grabbed Ben's crystal and green lightning started exploding from it and streaking across Kevin's body. The boy's flesh started to shift and transform, taking on elements of all ten demons seen to have possessed Ben's body before. Kevin was chuckling eagerly at first, excited to have the power, but soon started to wince, then cry out in pain. He shouted out that it was too much, that it was hurting, but soon his voice shifted into unintelligible angry shrieks. He grew to 11 feet tall with four arms, a tail, crackling distorted wings, and a skeletal three-eyed face. He stumbled forward, swinging his arms and smacking Max and Gwen aside, slamming them both against a brick wall and knocking them unconscious. He muttered and shrieked angrily, but Ben was sure, through all the demonic growls, he could still hear a scared voice saying, Help me! The mutated demonic boy stumbled off onto a side street, and the few people that saw him screamed out. He was still clumsily moving and swung a flaming fist towards them that just barely missed, but if he'd managed to strike anyone, he certainly would have killed them. Plus, if Kevin was still conscious but not in control, he was facing the exact same horror Ben had felt when he'd turned into that four-armed demon and nearly torn his own grandpa in half. Kevin could not only kill people, but would have to watch and be traumatized by the event knowing what he had done. As scared as Ben was, he couldn't stand the thought of someone else having to go through that as well. And he thought he may have a way to help. 
He turned to the wall and punched it, the brick splitting his knuckles, and he cried out in pain. But he did it again and again. He kept going, crying out to change, for some demon to overtake him, when suddenly a figure spoke from behind. Fascinating. You actually want to transform. Ben whipped around to see a teenage girl with purple, bubbling hair and glowing yellow eyes floating in a seated position in the air next to him. You've already served a greater purpose than I could have hoped, corrupting one of those annoying little gems. And he has taken your demons from you, so in a way, you are free. I can even take back my demonitrix, if you'd like. Unless you truly want to keep it. Realizing that this must be the demon who'd cursed him in the first place, Ben wanted to lash out at her, but didn't have time. Getting rid of the demonitrix was obviously tempting, but he knew he needed it if he wanted any hope of helping Kevin. So instead, he told her to give him another demon to turn into. Intrigued, she raised her hand and Ben's arm, with the cursed gem in it, suddenly shot up to her. She held it while tapping some glowing runes on her forearm, and the gem lit up with flashes of not just one, but dozens of more demonic forms, shooting like lightning through Ben's mind. When the visions cleared, the girl was gone, and Ben still hadn't transformed. Fury built up in him and he yelled out, COME ON! And as he yelled it, a rumbling growl rolled through along with the cry. He felt his body starting to change. His gums felt like they were on fire as his teeth stretched out farther into fangs, but he forced himself to stay with the pain and not go unconscious to it. As his body warped and cracked, he kept breathing as slowly as possible as Gwen and Grandpa had told him to do earlier. He still felt the anger and wrath, but tried to focus it and control it to use the strength beneath it to keep him conscious and set on his target. When the pain ceased, Ben had grown into a hulking tiger demon. He felt a near uncontrollable urge to grab people and hurl them around and tear them apart, but he set his mind on Kevin. He wasn't fully in control of himself, but with the image of Kevin in his mind, his demon body leapt out of the alley and after the mutated boy. Luckily, Kevin hadn't gotten to a main street yet, but his wings were starting to work and picking him up off the ground. Ben sprinted up behind him, leapt into the air, and tackled him out of the sky. Before Kevin could react, Ben hurled him into another back alley. A homeless man ran away from Kevin towards Ben, and Ben could feel the overwhelming urge to grab the man and devour him. But Ben did all he could to retarget that aggression. His claws started to raise, but then he let the man run past, and instead leapt at Kevin once more. The mutated demon thrust out a spiky crystal arm and a magma-dripping hand to grab Ben, but he still managed to tackle Kevin to the ground. Ben could feel his arm burning from the magma, and Kevin's jaw suddenly widened to bite down into Ben's shoulder. Ben could feel the pain of the bite converting into more rage. His demon form ripped Kevin's head back, and he could feel that he was about to bite Kevin's head off. His head still thrust forwards, but his jaw snapped shut early, and instead he just headbutted Kevin. Through gritted teeth, Ben forced his own words to come through. His words were churned in tiger growls, but still audible enough for him to get across to Kevin that he could fight back as well. Ben told him the instructions Grandpa Max had told him for getting rid of the angelic gem. Kevin's voice faintly came through, saying, Can't do it. Ben's foe flung them both into the air, then tackled Ben down into the cement. He thrust a crystal jutting hand right into the mouth on Ben's torso, but Ben caught it, just barely keeping it from piercing through him. Again, he assured Kevin that he could do it, that if Ben could control this, then so could Kevin. But Ben's strength was starting to fail. The shards of Kevin's arm were inching closer and closer to impaling Ben, but then he saw that one of Kevin's extra arms was slowly moving towards the gem on his stomach. The clawed finger tapped it three times. Through demonic gurgling, Kevin's voice said the phrase, Gem of the Angelic, I relinquish your might. As soon as he finished, he shrieked out in pain and stomped back away from Ben. All the demon forms of Kevin's body started shrinking in towards the crystal. His body warped and contorted back to its normal form, and the crystal burst from his stomach and clinked across the ground. 
Kevin fell back to the cement, shaking. Ben also remained lying on the ground in relief. All the anger that he'd been using to fight slowly fading away. His own body shifted back to its normal state. Ben was emotionally drained and physically exhausted. But in that moment, the fear he'd had of his curse had shifted slightly into a sense of wonder. If he could control his demons, what else could he do with their powers? There was more Multiverse Tales lore worked into that than a usual non-Multiverse Tales episode. But even if you were just here for the Ben 10 stuff, I hope you enjoyed the alternate take. Also, if you're new to the channel and you want more Ben 10 stuff, you might want to check out my Ben 10 Aliens as Dragons Part 2 episode. Or if you want more Demon stuff, maybe my recent My Hero Academia Demons episode. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note. And the thought I want to leave people with today is a quote from a man named Humble the Poet who says that being selfish is not putting yourself first, it's expecting other people to put you first. Putting time into helping other people is great, but you have to make sure that you're taking care of yourself first, or else you could end up burning yourself out, making yourself sick, and then long-term not being available to help other people at all. I hope that's inspiring, especially to any people pleasers out there, as I'm a recovering one of those myself. I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next episode on Monday. Goodbye.